pleasure to well let's start again and good evening everybody and it gives me great pleasure to have all of you here this evening we know that october has been declared by the world as down syndrome awareness month and we have been wondering uh, we've always had a down syndrome day on in march uh, uh, on the 21st of march 21 uh, representing uh, the number of uh, the, the, the chromosome that is extra, three of chromosome extra. And then it was decided that, yes, we should expand that to not just be a day in the year, but actually a complete awareness month so that people could, could, could get educated. And we were wondering why this was happening. And then we made inquiries and we realized that there was a lot of lack of awareness uh, that was going on and that we should also realize our responsibility here as members of the Society of Healing Medicine. And I'm so glad that uh, Dr. Bimal Sani and Dr. Aparna Sharma put together this evening uh, an excellent program for us where I will be giving a bit of an introduction. We will then have a, uh, a pledge uh, which will be read out by Dr. Bimal Sani, which we expect all of us to listen to, repeat in our minds and believe in. And then we will have a panel discussion on how things should really go ahead. So I'm going to uh, move on to my uh, screen share now and make sure that we uh, get a background on all of this and realize that yes, uh, life is different today compared to a little while ago. When we look at Down syndrome, we realize that there is that extra chromosome 21 or a little extra piece of chromosome 21 in case it's a translocation. And then we are in a dilemma very often. It used to be easy when tests were not available, when our understanding was not there. We discovered a Down syndrome baby after it was born and we gave it everything we had and we had excellent outcomes. Being a multidisciplinary organization that we are at Society of Field Medicine, we've always believed that we give every fetus an optimal outcome. And we will discuss this further today because these words were specially chosen with things like Down syndrome in mind where we have a dilemma because we wish to open mind to fetal needs and we know that this has been happening uh, over the last 12 years now. But the question then arises, how much and what and should we think of our Down syndrome babies as anything less than babies with any other uh, kind of a, a challenge and therefore what we should be doing with this. So let me plunge into this business of should extra be less and take you through uh, the background of what is Down syndrome. We know uh, that when a person has three rather than two copies of, uh, of uh, chromosome 21, then it results in Down syndrome. And it is the commonest uh, congenital cause of mental uh, challenges and disabilities as we used to call them earlier. We changed over our words from challenge, from disability to challenge, and now back again to disabilities, because we realized that one of the kind of supports we need from the community in this situation is um, financial support from what India is supposed to be, which is a welfare state, which means that the state needs to help us to look after babies that may not be able to be supported by their own families. And because the law talks of disabilities and the forms talk of disabilities, we've had to bring that word back again uh, so that people can understand this particular word. So from that point of view, we've had to go back from challenge to disabilities. The problem is that it can lead to considerable ill health, although some individuals have only a minimal uh, problem and can lead relatively normal lives. And this is what we're going to be discussing today and taking this forward because there is no doubt that having a baby with Down syndrome is likely to have a very significant impact on family life. Uh, there is currently no known cure for this, although there are some in the pipeline. The good news is that we can have a Down syndrome diagnosis during pregnancy and parents and family can then benefit from preparing for a baby with Down syndrome. But on the other hand, we do have these dilemmas. And what are these dilemmas? First is that in any given case, science and technology as of today 
cannot predict neurodevelopmental and body function compromise. Which individual with Down syndrome will be uh, having a severe neurodevelopmental problem or which one of them will have a body function compromise as the years go by and which ones would we lose early? There is no way to tell. We do know that on the one side, many individuals with Down syndrome can live fulfilled lives and we see this around us all the time. On the other hand, we have most parents seeking options, including termination of pregnancy. So for us who are at the diagnostic crossroads for everybody, we don't know which way to go. The one side with not even offering a diagnosis or a possibility of screening for Down syndrome. And on the other side, uh, counseling patients on what they might need to do with that information. And we do hope that today's uh, discussion will sort this out. In India, the problem is driven deeper by lack of government welfare funds, which are just not available in the amount that we need them or where we need them. And the other side of the story is that we don't have adequate community acceptance or community support for individuals that have needs that some babies with Down syndrome might have. Of course, this is also overplayed by personal and religious beliefs. And therefore, it leads to quite a conundrum in our heads. But of course, there is um, some things that we can sort out right in the beginning. Because, you know, we've done a lot of work on Down syndrome over the years. We've known since 1862 that, the, um, that there was this particular morphology with a flat face, a relatively small nose, and a change in the elasticity of the skin, which gives us a thickened nuchal which we've been able to recognize on ultrasound scans. We discovered in 1959, with the help of Jeremy Lee Yoon, that Down syndrome is due to trisomy 21 or a translocation 21, and that therefore we could do a diagnostic test for this particular condition. We also have realized that these babies can live fairly long, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and even seventh decade, but that they do have quality of life issues, and that the incidence at birth is about one in 800. Some say these days one in 700, but about one in 800 all over the world. And therefore, this does alter the way a family or a community is going to handle such an individual. And it becomes our responsibility then to give them the best of facilities. Because the reality is that a large number of parents all over the world want options and often choose not to continue their pregnancy. Can you and me reject that demand altogether? And how best can we handle it? And we have a lot of counseling that will explain to us today how best to handle it. We have realized that over the years, a diagnostic tests cannot be afforded by everyone, even though they are safe. And therefore screening is an option where we identify as many patients as possible that should be tested by diagnostic testing in order to make sure that we give patients these options and we will discuss these. And we do understand also that first trimester screening is far more effective than later screening. And we do understand this. And so in today's panel discussion, we will go ahead and see what we can do, but we will put it in an appropriate background, which means counseling, counseling and counseling with the first one to tell our patients that yes, indeed, you could go right ahead, not do Down syndrome screening, and just happily have a baby with Down syndrome and enjoy the most beautiful smiles in the world because we know that the bright look on a baby uh, with Down syndrome is not matched by human beings who don't have that little bit extra. So truly speaking, we are the ones that have less and they are the lucky ones with the extra because they learn to smile so much more with just that little bit of extra. Moving on, we do also understand that we will not do screening in patients who would either opt for direct invasive testing because they really want those options seriously. And that we will not offer it in patients who will not terminate for religious or personal reasons because really there is no treatment, like I said, and therefore we have to consider this. We know that things have changed over the years and we will discuss this and we moved on from the reduced alpha fetoprotein levels of 1984 to the NIPT in uh, in, in, in 2011, and uh, then, of course, uh, to the various additional tests we have today, and we will take you through all of these. We know that the first story in ultrasound came from Beryl Benassaraf in 1987, 
and then was translated in the first trimester by Kipros Nikolaitis in 1992. And the world has never really looked back ever since because the world over, there has been this demand. And this is what we will learn to balance uh, today. We've come a long way from the original image. And the bottom left image here is the original image by Kipros Nikolaitis of nucleidema. And on the right side is the kind of uh, clarity we get with current machines. And you can see how much more we can truly see inside. Uh, of course, uh, NIPT has been the game changer and we will put that into perspective, especially with the reduced costs of NIPT and its wide availability. So what are our challenges? One of them, of course, is suboptimal imaging. We have unreliable biochemistry. And then we have this awful rush to terminate on the basis of a screening test. How can we handle this? These are the questions we're going to answer today. And then also we're going to answer, like I said before, how do we handle the dilemma of a direct reference to cell-free fetal DNA? So with that, I will leave you to the rest of the webinar tonight. And we do hope that we can answer some of these uh, questions today, which is that what do we offer our patients? How do we counsel our patients? How is it done in various parts of the world? How is it done in various other religious communities that believe differently uh, from what we are taught in medical school and so on? And what should be our approach to giving patient options? So over now uh, to Dr. Bimal Sani for the pledge that we're all going to uh, take. May I request Dr. Bimal Sani to read out the pledge and we will uh, go over it in our minds and pledge for it in our hearts. So over to Dr. Bimal Sani for the pledge. Give me a moment. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Bimal, but we have to go full screen. Yes, sir. Yeah. I want the, all the members of Society of Fetal Medicine and uh, everyone who is attending this meeting tonight to take a pledge, read it in your own mind, because this whole program today is with the aim that we accept you. And that is why our pledge is also about, I accept you. So I'll read this pledge. The I accept you pledge for Down syndrome embodies our unwavering commitment to inclusivity, inclusivity and understanding. We declare that everyone belongs in our shared journey and we pledge to stand by those with Down syndrome not merely for them. With empathy and respect, we embrace the principle of with us, not for us, recognizing that individuals with Down syndrome are integral members of our communities. Together, we will foster an environment where differences are celebrated, potential is unleashed, and every individual, regardless of their abilities, is valued and cherished. Thank you, Bimal. Thank you very much for that. And uh, before we move on to our panel discussion for tonight, I want you to listen very carefully to a message that we have from Unati Sharma. You will recognize her when you see her and you will know what condition she has. But when you see how beautifully she is speaking to us, you will listen to her carefully and start believing what she has to say. So Vishal, could we please have Unati's uh, video and let's listen to that for a few minutes. Hello. Did you know that Down syndrome is the most common genetic anomaly? And yet, there are so many who haven't even heard of it or 
डोंट हैव कंप्लीट इंफॉर्मेशन अक्टूबर इज डाउन सिंड्रोम अवेयरनेस मंथ सो दिस अक्टूबर जॉइन मी एंड माय फ्रेंड्स एंड डू योर बिट टू मेक दिस वर्ल्ड मोर इंक्लूसिव प्लीज एडुकेट योर सेल्स अबाउट आर अबिलिटीज आर चैलेंजेस आर अचीवमेंट्स बिकॉज awareness is the first step to empowerment share it with your family friends on your social media get the conversation started just like you we also deserve this opportunity to live fulfilling lives don't you agree thank you yes we agree and honestly speaking uh, i don't think we need anything more after this the message is loud and clear thank you bimal and you know we will put this on to our website as well and we will have it um in uh, uh, on our youtube and we will listen to it again and again to be realize that we have to change our approach completely from what is a cut and dried um, uh, a medical uh, approach to this uh we now move on to our uh, uh, panel discussion and uh, i invite dr aparna sharma to uh, conduct this uh, uh, panel discussion for us our panelists uh, tonight dr aparna sharma of course requires no introduction she is a uh, secretary our national executive executive secretary of the society of field medicine and uh, a professor at the all india institute of medical sciences new delhi and she will take us through the questions on our panel we have a uh, former uh, president dr t l m praveen uh, dr kanchan mukherji who heads our regional chapter in bengal uh, dr minu batra who has been leading our activities in kerala and at the center for some time now uh, dr reema bhat who is our national joint secretary we have dr tamkin khan who amongst other things is uh, not just a practicing obstetrician or an academician but also works very beautifully with stillbirth which brings her into encounters with uh, with uh, uh, with uh, with down syndrome all the time as part of a differential diagnosis and we look forward to her participation we have dr navin perera who has been spearheading our activities in ludhiana and punjab as well as at the center he's on our central executive committee as well and uh, welcome navin and uh, with that we go forward uh, with our panel discussion we also had an invitation for dr anjalika dasne who is one of our members from the emirates but she is not able to connect with us today and so we will not have her on the panel discussion today but we look forward to everyone else uh, participating actively in the appropriate perspective so over to you dr parna sharma for this discussion thank you very much sir and uh, i would say uh, welcome to this panel discussion on you know uh, we have named it actually the down syndrome i'll just put this in the yeah so we've named this panel the down syndrome screening the hits and misses so uh, over these years we've been working obsessed with aneuploidy screening so much that her, our whole antenatal care seems to revolve a lot around aneuploidy screening so when i was starting to plan this panel i was first you know kind of confused whether i should be talking completely technical about how the down syndrome screening works or also cover the you know the humanitarian aspect on on the first basic question on whether we should be doing screening so in between the two i decided you know i should take a middle path so we'll have some technical aspect but at the same time we would like to know the opinion of our panelists on the various important aspect that dr kurana has covered a disclaimer is that i have not given any questions to the panelists and i'm really sorry about that so we just hope that we speak from the heart right so just to begin with i would say that you know i just read this article on the last children of down syndrome this this article is from denmark where which was the first country to start the down syndrome screening and they really described that the number of people who are born with down syndrome has now come down to less than 13 per year 
while US alone has a Down syndrome prevalence of around 6,000 children being born with Down syndrome. Now, uh, when we go through the panel, uh, I would say, you know, what are the things that we have actually achieved in terms of Down syndrome screening? It is that universal screening, we have a battery of tests, there is increasing efficacy, decreasing costs. But on the other hand, you know, what are what is the flip side to screening? And there's something called a very interesting term called the velvet eugenics. And I would talk about it a little later. But of course, we do have, you know, false negatives where we are screening, but yet we do have babies who are born with Down syndrome. And then we get these uh, questions on how to go about it. So we will, of course, cover the technical aspect of it on, you know, the various questions on screening, because, you know, that information is important, the options are important. But at the same time, we will need to see how we counsel these women, and how do we go about it. So I'll just start with a low risk primary gravida, 26 year old at 12 weeks of gestation who has come for a routine checkup. And my question to Dr. Tamkeen is, she's low risk, she has no high risk factor, no family history. Would you, how, would you like to offer aneuploidy screening and is that your policy given your surroundings, given your setting? And what have you seen? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Aparna. Uh, first of all, the argument for screening for aneuploidy and commonness is caused down syndrome it is responsible for almost 50 to 20, 15 to 20 percent of intellectual disability and then it, they have a long uh, lifespan and uh, 50 percent of the diseases uh -huh. can be missed on ultrasound so the thing is that it certifies more of the most of the criteria for screening for a disease and most of the guidelines international guidelines they will uh -huh. Uh, you know, they have given this recommendation that all women should be screened. But uh, for us Indians, we have to take into account many things. First of all, we do not have any guideline. Only the Indian Academy of Pediatrics recommends that they should be screened. Foxy has just echoed the recommendation by RCOG. No, no, nothing based on data or cost effectiveness in our part of the world. Then the problems inherent with screening. First of all, the, there's no awareness. Most of the patients will not understand unless they have somebody in the family or they are dealing with it. Sometimes when they already have a baby, they will not accept the screening because they are so much attached to the baby. I had recently a nurse practitioner who was working in the DIC. The father was insisting on screening. She was saying, no, ma'am, I cannot go ahead. I'm working these babies. And there was a lot of you know argument debate within the family. So, and uh, besides that, the validity of the test, many of the patients do not understand the difference between screening and diagnosis, diagnostic testing. Many will think they will not be counseled properly. Then, first of all, we should have proper awareness, both of the healthcare workers, the validation of the test, different labs who are performing the screening, of, and the, of course, the ultrasound as well. You have people doing the NI, uh, this thing, the nuclear transparency, but it is not so many times you find that it's not being done in the correct manner. So all these will have a lot of false negatives, false positives. So it is all going to fail. So unless we have a certain standard, we have data from our own population. Personally, I don't think so. I do not offer it to all women. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. I think we covered a lot of aspects to Down syndrome screening. So like what ma'am said, we have, as far as the guidelines are concerned, we do have, uh, you know, guidelines universally speaking that it should be offered to everyone. But the reality may be different. So uh, I think, sir, we should have a SFM position statement regarding the aneuploidy screening. I think that is something that is time has come for that uh, thing to happen. So uh, like what ma'am saying that it's the pre-test counseling is important. It should be an opt-in approach. Uh, we must offer as much as possible. The awareness has to be there along with the implementation and the implications of the whole thing. And as far as, you know, the referrals are concerned, we all understand that I think the, the sonography or the radiology has moved in so much that there's so much detection of the second trimester anomalies, which are actually leading to a down, question about Down syndrome screening. But the awareness about the first trimester Down syndrome screening is still a lot needs to be done. Now, uh, ma'am, you want to say something? Yes. Sometimes, you know, once you screen them, they will not go for the diagnostic testing and then they get their pregnancy terminated somewhere else. 
So right, ma'am. Is... We come to that question. I have that specific question here on the panel. So, uh, just to get our basics straight, so Dr. Meenu, uh, would you like? So she's a young patient. She's come for a routine checkup. So, what is the method? Method. So, just to get our basics clear here, what is your routine practice, and what is the method that you offer to everyone? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Parana, for the question. So, uh, well, if the patient agrees to undergo screening. The ideal time would be at this when she has come to us, that is between 11 to 14, 13 weeks, six days of gestation. And uh, I being working in radiology, yes, I would want to offer her a combined test as the first line of screening, Yeah, which would include an ultrasound, wherein we would do a detailed structural anatomical evaluation, also look at the other aneuploidy markers, including the NT and the rest of the things. And along with that, we would do a biochemistry, uh, wherein we would get uh, the beta HCG and the free PAPA levels and following which we decide as to which next line of investigation needs to be done. Now, if the scan is in particularly completely normal, uh, in certain specific scenarios, like when the mother has an advanced maternal age, we may give them an option as to whether they want to go for cell-free DNA analysis, that's NIPT for Down syndrome screening. Yes, so we, Dr. Meenu, uh, you, we hold that thought there because we're going to come to that question in yes. some time. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Meenu. I think okay. uh, routinely for people who are actually offering and we should also try to offer everybody as you're suggesting that a first trimester screening is desirable and we must offer it to everybody. Now, like what we have been yes. you know, questioning, this lady, yeah. this is a case which came to us some time back and she was referred at 12 weeks of pregnancy with the previous mm. pregnancy termination at 18 weeks for Down syndrome, supposedly. Now, when we reviewed the record, it actually showed a quadruple report of 1 in 109 based on which, based on which that pregnancy was terminated. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure all of you have come across some situation where a pregnancy has been terminated for, uh, you know, a supposed positive report. Now, uh, Dr. Reema, uh, what would you say about this? And what is the pre-test and the post-test counseling that you offer to avoid such problems in your practice? Dr. Dima, are you there? Yes. So I'll unmute. Thank you for this question, Dr. Aparna. So the most important thing that we need to tell our patient is that when she is screen positive, does not mean that the baby is a case of Down syndrome. We need to tell that there is a possibility that out of 100, the risk that she has, out of so many women, there'll be one child who will be affected with Down syndrome and we need to do further testing. We have a cafeteria of tests that are available in the armamentarium and we need to choose the best test. We need to tell her that the test that she's undergone, which is a combined test, will have a detection rate of only 89 to 90% as far as Down syndrome is concerned. We need to confirm these findings either by doing a secondary screening test like a NIPT or we need to go ahead with invasive testing for confirming a diagnosis of a baby with Down syndrome. So what is extremely important is your pre-test counseling is important. And this happens only the couple have to be counseled that they have to go ahead with further testing if they want to go ahead with termination of pregnancy. But they would not terminate a, a pregnancy based only on a report of a combined first trimester screening. That is the most important thing. So we right. offer, yeah. In, so uh, thank you, Dr. Rima. I think the pre-test counseling is so important. We can prevent so many pregnancies from being terminated. So I would like to, you know, take an opinion from Dr. Kurana on this, that, you know, how can we make this pre-test and post-test counseling more robust for a better utilization or rather a less misutilization of these screening tests so that normal babies are not terminated? Yes, you're absolutely right. We do need to create um, a far more robust program the question is, is this to be created by the medical community or is this to be created by people in general? Tragically, our nation has reached a position where pushing and pulling seems to be the way of life rather than a peaceful existence or waiting in line for everybody. Now, this has really changed everybody's attitude where everybody wants perfection and everybody wants everything just now and everyone wants the easiest way out without thinking. So truly speaking, the most important thing is to change the national mindset, which sounds very easy when we say it, but we know we've not been able to change the national mindset, far less change a single patient's mindset. The 
awareness has to start at different levels and we have to have all our partners in this, which includes people who provide these tests in terms of laboratories. And they have to be told that, look, you have to have education awareness programs for everyone. The other thing is, of course, that we should have to an extent possible that even in programs that don't involve gynecologists, obstetricians and, and caregivers in pregnancy, we have to have compulsory program, just like our medical councils have lectures on ethics in every single uh, continuing medical education program. We need to include and showcase what is possible today in programs of other specialties, which includes the association of physicians, for instance, and so on, as an example. The, the next thing that you and me must do is to make sure that each one of us learns up counseling in exactly the format that we're supposed to speak without missing out. So it has to be a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, a checklist for counseling, which is where I think the Society of Fetal Medicine can now play a major role, that we give a checklist for counseling, which starts off with the fact that, look, in many places of the world, it is believed that today uh, invasive testing is so safe so as to be offered to every single patient. However, because it is compromised by people's expertise in the field and by the fact that no one in the in, no nation in the world can afford this. And therefore, we offer screening tests. And that's where the list should begin. And I think if all of us at SFM can get together, we should be able to prepare a checklist for counseling, which has to be a single page, a list of six or seven things, and make sure that this is not offered in the same way as we offer hemoglobin blood group and a standard test for syphilis. Right, sir. I think that is the last punchline is so true. In the antenatal care, hemoglobin and dual marker are treated like the same without a difference between, you know, having the stressed upon the pre-test counseling that, you know, what is the interpretation of this report. So moving on to the next aspect, which is the, uh, which is another Pandora's box, I must say, because we, as we go down deeper into testing, we get more confused. Now, uh, Dr. Kanchan, uh, would you tell me that, you know, this low risk patient, would you in your practice, would you, is there a role of NIPT and would you offer this patient NIPT? Yes, um, role is definitely there. But as uh, Dr. Uh, Minu said that it is like a cafeteria approach. It's not like a run of the mill test and you, the patient comes to me means she's on the conveyor belt and then she has to undergo all these tests just that is the problem that what we have been discussing so far that the routinization of a special test has caused the biggest damage so far and if someone can afford of course they can go for an IPT if someone after the full discussion says no thank you very much I do not want to undergo any kind of screening test again we would respect that choice so a direct answer to your question. Yes, there is a role of NIPT to this lady. Yeah. So thank you, sir. I think the I, I really like the term routinization of a special test. It is not hemoglobin, right? So we need to understand that. And I think you put it very well on that aspect. So definitely there is a role of NIPT, which is when there is a high risk. That's what most of the societies have mentioned. More than 35 years, ultrasound suggesting increased risk when you have a test positive. But of course, it's again like a cafeteria approach that, you know, maybe, maybe it is not like a primary screening population. We need to consider individual choices. Now, uh, Dr. Naveen, I would like to say in your practice, right? So in your practice, you know, like, like, like I, I just love what Dr. Kurana says that we must stop treating, treating ourselves as a third world country. And because we do come across patients who can afford things here now. So in your practice, you have all kinds of patients. So now what is the role of biochemistry in the era of NIPT? Because this is an important question on deciding. This is a patient who can afford everything. She says, doctor, tell me the best thing and I'll go for it. So do you think there is still role of biochemistry in the present day testing? Dr. Naveen? Yeah, I'm unmuted now. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for having me in this panel. Uh, well, well, we're talking of biochemistry, we're talking of first trimester and second trimester biochemistry. So, well, uh, first trimester biochemistry, 
in, I will talk about my practice. So what we usually do is uh, we have an anti uh, first time screening that's an anti scan, and we take a sample for a biochemistry. Now, depending upon the um, status of the individual, if they can have a PLJF along with that, we add that too, or we just have a dual marker test. And usually what we do is we have NIPT as a secondary screening modality. If we find this kind of a risk where the patient doesn't go for an invasive test and that in that case, uh, we would or the risk is not so high that would, would warrant an invasive test. That is where we would uh, go for a NIPT test. That is what would happen in our scenario. Right, right. So thank you. So I think you've reinforced what we've been discussing that the first choice is FTS with, uh, you know, a first trimester uh, screen, which includes a, combi a dual marker with NT. And you would also add PLGF. And I think I must really thank you for adding that PLGF component because somewhere preeclampsia screening has to be there in our minds. So uh, in terms of offering NIPT, yes. I mean, of course, if more than 35 years, other high risk factors, then we definitely offer NIPT. But in today's day and age, I think everybody of us tells the patient that, oh, look, there is a test which has a better detection rate. And of course, it remains your choice whether you do it. So this particular, you know, there are a series of studies which actually told us that, you know, in terms of the aneuploidy screening for the basic aneuploidies, the false positivity rate for CFDNA is quite low and the positive predictive value is quite high when you compare even in a low risk population. So we must be aware and we must tell our patients that, okay, look, this test is available and we must think about it. But whatever you do, we must offer one primary screening test and not get the patient confused that it should not be an allied screening and cell-free DNA should not be sent concurrently as this strategy is not cost effective. So we must inform our patients, choose one form of, of screening rather than confusing them with a cocktail of tests. So I think that's something which is very, very important. So now, uh, in so like, I think this is something that we've uh, discussed that like what Dr. Kanchan was also saying that in case, so Dr. Meenu, what do you do if a patient is like this, you know, in case of an advanced gestation, uh, advanced maternal age? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, in these kind of scenarios, we do offer them NIPT. Again, it's the choice that they make. But yes, in these kind of specific situations where her maternal age-related risk, the background risk itself is higher, we do give them an option of NIPT over offer, offering them a routine combined test screening. Right, right. Thank you. So I just want to know from our panelists if anybody offers a routine NIPT. Anybody offers a routine NIPT? No. I do. Yeah. I I order a, I offer a routine diagnostic. I order a, you know I tell them all that look you could undergo diagnostic testing if you want to and then we can forget the screening. And right. I offer this to every patient across the board, poor or rich, because I firmly believe that appearances can be very deceptive, and every patient has a right to know everything. And if we can raise money for other things, we can raise money for this. It's a question of changing our mindset. We're changing our mindset today about such lofty things, such as our approach to challenges in people's lives. We can certainly change this. Then I tell them that, yes, occasionally the NIPT may not uh, give me results. And we can get what they call a no-call, a failed NIPT. is very sophisticatedly called a no-call and not a failed test. And then at least I have a backup of something. So yes, uh, that would be a possibility. And uh, the other thing is that sometimes, uh, because the result takes so long, uh, you might want that the result of this simpler uh, screening test uh, should be available much sooner. And the NIPT will not take that long. So it works both ways and can make up for one or the other. But most importantly, really, the reason why for everyone who's offered an NIPT, I also offer biochemistry is because I have such faith in PLGF as a screening test for preeclampsia, which for me is a far more dreaded disease in this country. Therefore, right. I offer that to everybody, even if I'm offering an NIPT. So it works both ways. Right. So thank you, sir. And I actually, I'm, I'm aware of this and I really, you know, kind of, you know, it really shows the variation in the approach and which is everything is like you know it's it's what your patients can afford what is the availability what is the best test which is available so we need to kind of you know understand and offer that basket to the patient and understand the best way forward so dr tlen praveen sir 
like you know nipt is now just everywhere but it is like you know touching the uh, you know sensitive nerve of the radiologist but you know how does the nipt stand with respect to the nt scan uh, basically uh, nipt in the era of nipt um, i mean as you said uh, the role of uh, preliminary screening in the form of uh, nt as well as combined screening or biochemical screening um, the the role is slowly coming down but then uh, there are certain situations where an ipt may be a uh, problematic in sense you need to do a primary screening in the sense ultrasound scan in order to rule out certain factors which can influence the results of an ipt basically in the form of a, a, a fetal demise or if it is a multiple gestation, or if it is a, a, a structurally abnormal fetus, which can be detected by what is called as the pre-NIPT scan. I think that should be a primary uh, 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 tool which we need to use in this era where we have the uh, NIPT coming in. Now, coming to NT, yes, uh, the, the categorical statement says that we have to do a primary screening, when chin, if in case if it falls into an intermediate risk, that is when we offer the NIPT. But then now as NIPT is very freely available and it is very easy to do instead of struggling to get the NT and as well as the other um, ultrasound markers, NIPT has taken over. So I think in this era of NIPT, the role more than the NT is the, uh, uh, the other factors which influence the results of NIPT has to be considered. Right, right. So I think very nicely put is that you can't do NIPT unless you have a good initial screening scan. That is number one. So even before you order NIPT, the baby may not be viable at that time. So let's just confirm that there is a baby and then order NIPT. So that's a very brilliantly put point across. And this is what this study also so showed that 16.1% had a finding which would have changed the uh, even the question of NIPT. But of course, all the radiologists, all the fetal medicine specialists here would agree that NT scan is now a mini anomaly scan and it is not threatened by NIPT. You would still go for a good quality NT scan and that is that has to be underlined here that NT scan is NT scan and it has to be done in its full earnest uh, you know, effort. So all women should be offered. SWOG also says first trimester ultrasound, ultrasound scan, despite in regardless of their intention to undergo cell-free DNA testing. So, Dr. Rima, I would just like to know that you know, uh, any who can send NIPT here? I just want to ask you, you know, over the counter sending NIPT samples, how does it work? And how would you advise NIPT to, you know, your patients? Like, you know, is there any precaution that you take while you're sending NIPT samples? And how has it affected your fetal medicine practice? Dr. Rima, are you there? Yes. So the first, uh, to answer to your first question, who can send NIPT, what we just discussed that you can send NIPT after an NT scan because if your NT is increased during an NT scan, you will not order for an NIPT. It will directly be an invasive testing. So generally, when an NIPT is sent, it has to be somebody with who is practicing fetal medicine would be a better option. But yes, obstetricians with a good NT scan, have having seen the NT scan, can also ask for a NIPT, but preferably it should go from somebody who's practicing fetal medicine. That's the first point because it you have to take a lot of things into consideration as to why you're asking NIPT. Is it as a primary screening tool or as a secondary screening modality where you've had a high risk on your combined first trimester screening and you do not want to do an invasive testing and want to go for NIPT. Now, uh, the answer to your second question is that any precautions while counseling and sending NIPT samples? Yes, we have to uh, look at the patient. There are certain conditions that do affect the cell fraction in the patient. So if your patient is obese, she has increased BMI, she's had transfusions, malignancy, or if she's a mosaic, there could be alterations in the reporting of NIPT. And therefore, whenever an NIPT sample has to be sent, you have to take all these conditions into consideration before you ask for an NIPT. The timing is also important. You cannot send it before 10 weeks because then you would not have adequate 
uh, cells in the maternal DNA. And also during counseling, you need to tell the patient that these are mosaic cells. These are surrogate markers of the fetus. They're actually from the placenta that these cells are released. So possibility of mosaicism also exists. With this adequate counseling, you will go ahead with sending your NIPT sample. Right. Thank you, Dr. Reema. And I think you've answered the next question as well. So there was this lady who was 23 weeks POG, first trimester screen uh, was normal, uh, but I don't know why. And, you know, I think this happens a number of times that a quad marker was done, which was high risk of T21. So dual marker was not done. NTNB was done. So NIPT was done, which turned out to be high risk for T21. And then this patient underwent amniocentesis. So Dr. Naveen, just a question on, you know, what are the chances that a fetus who's positive is actually affected? So is it important in the post-test counseling that, okay, now the test has come, what are the chances that my baby is actually going to be affected? So basically, uh, we have to understand when I when we are doing a quadruple test or a NIPT, these are screening tests. And uh, yes, NIPT has got a very high positive predictive value, and uh, especially for trisomy 21. So in that case, uh, there would be a high chance that it could be done, but it is, uh, it's not a definite diagnostic test. Your 100% diagnosis is always going to be by invasive test, which is either immunosynthesis or CVS. And that's where our uh, answers are going to come. Right, right. So thank you. I, the point here is that, you know, like we said, if a biochemistry is positive, it is not necessary that the baby is affected. If the NIPT is positive, even then it's not necessary that the baby is affected. So if this is something that we really need to keep in mind that we will not terminate a pregnancy on NIPT positive. And this is the OAPR, which is the odds of being affected with a positive result, which is in a high risk, it is one in five, but the, in a low risk population, it is one in 20. So 19 times the baby might be normal. So that is something that we really need to keep this in mind. And the reasons for false positive have just been, uh, you know, recounted for by Dr. Rima. So in this particular case, actually the karyotype came to be normal. And that's what we wanted to insist. And this lady actually continued the pregnancy and had a healthy baby. So it's important to understand the limitations of uh, screening test. So just to, again, you know, try kind of emphasize that, yes, one could be a false positive. But the other thing is that what could be the no call or the, you know, the fancy term for failures, as Dr. Kulana is saying, that, you know, how could, what do you do when you have a failure in NIPT, no call in NIPT? Yeah, so when you have a failure result, it's very important for us to look at the whole picture. For example, we need to look for, uh, as when Dr. Rima said, that whether the patient was obese. So did we get a no-call result because of the dilutional effect that, you know, you did not get an NIPT result and therefore you realize that probably even if I do a repeat sample, uh, I might not be able to get the result in this case. Again, when you have to look at the fetal fraction. Now, if you find that the fetal fraction is really low, and uh, you need to probably relook at your ultrasound again to look whether there are any other features of trisomy 18 or 13, because sometimes the low fetal fraction may also be indirectly uh, calling upon all these kind of aneuploidies. And you want to go back and recheck on your ultrasound whether you have uh, missed something or not. So in these kind of situations, we really need to revisit, look at the patient's profile and then decide as to why we are not getting a result on NIPT. Right, right. Thank you. So as much as our geneticists would like to say that, okay, you could repeat, we really need to see that we should repeat an NIPT or maybe go for a diagnostic test. And this is the ACNG statement, which says that you have to offer a diagnostic test for prefer to offer a diagnostic yeah. test for no call NIPS. No call. Yes. Thank you. So Dr. Praveen, Dr. Tilan Praveen, sir, uh, would you believe how, what is your practice of an expanded conventional first trimester screening? So, which also includes, a, you know, an alpha fetoprotein dimeric inhumane in the first trimester uh, biochemistry. Have you pent a marker like, or have you been doing it or what is your take on it? Uh, quite often, we don't really ask for this pent a marker, but then uh, in a given case, wherever there is a high suspicion and wherever there is a requirement, then definitely we need to uh, embark upon it. Uh, uh, so, uh, because the detection rates are very high and then the false positive, uh, I mean, false positive rates are low. So, advantages of the screening for the early onset, I mean, the, because of the penta markers, you can definitely, uh, PLGF is also included. So, you can also um, get some answers regarding the preeclampsia. 
So I so think. I, I would, yeah, sir, I would like to ask uh, yeah. you and all of the panelists whether we are offering this to our patients or we are not. No, we are not, are not on a regular basis. I don't offer them. Right. Dr. So Kurana, sir. I, am, I offer this to my patients very regularly. And uh, it's a very economical test because uh, it also includes a very beautiful risk for preeclampsia. And unlike some of the companies that would only give us a single reading for a high risk of preeclampsia, this will tell me the difference between uh, less than 32 weeks and 37 weeks and so on. And the only one it doesn't include is term preeclampsia. I also let them know that the original paper that came out for the PENTA test had uh, Kipros Nicolaitis as its co-author. So it wasn't really a small validation study. It was a fairly large validation study. And that it does give me a 98.5% uh, detection rate with a false positive rate of 1.2%, which for the Indian population means a lot. One of the reasons why they keep saying, oh, this is a horrible test and we should not do a first trimester screen is because of our false positives. And this truly helps in that. What has also happened is that the price line is hardly any different anymore. So depending on who the provider is, the price line is almost the same. And therefore, it seems to be working out very different from what it thought it would have worked out. So I really have lots of people who will opt out of an NIPT and take on a PENTA. Yeah, yeah. So I think I've also had the experience of the same for actually people who are affording. Dr. Reema, you wanted to say something. No, I. that's what, what Kurana says, just voiced. I also feel that if we have such a good test, we can start using it uh, with patients who can afford it. I was just going to say, sir, just voiced my words. Thank you. Right. Thank, uh, you. If Thank I, you. If Aparna, can I, can I just sir, say sir, something? Dr. Kanchan, yes, sir. Yes, yes. Um, obviously, um, I may be working with a different client profile where I think anything beyond NT is luxury. Okay, so uh, whether I add, uh, I feel myself lucky if I can add a combined test. I feel myself ecstatic if I can uh, add um, an IPT to that. So PENTA screening here is a complete luxury to me. And um, contrary to what has been said so far, do not think India is a poor country. I think India is rich for a handful only. India is still poor for the majority. I completely agree with your point of view, sir. It is like, you know, we have multiple countries even within our own country. And so the question here is to, do we take it as a routine guidance? Definitely not. But do we know and inform that, okay, you for a particular, you know, person who's affording that, okay, there is a test with this affordability with this particular detection rate. So maybe that is where it needs to be considered. And I completely agree that, you know, of course, the basic thing is just FTS and dual marker. And that is again being underlined again and again. We no. completely understand that the first trimester screening is the most affordable, reasonable and desirable practice. There is no two ways about it. But as we move on, we must also understand what are the new things available and what is the applicability in which bracket. So Dr. Pra Praveen, sir. Yeah, uh, basically there are most of the companies now which are offering the uh, combined screening with the PSA. So I think that will answer most of our problems. And in case if the patient can afford, I would prefer to get an NIPT done rather than wait for the PENTA, I mean, do the PENTA because that way, uh, my first trimester screening, combined screening, where I have a free beta HCG, PAPE, plus the PLGF, gives me more. Yeah. Right, sir. And I think you put across a very good point because this is the reason Penta Marker never took off. Because it has the same uh, thing as NIPT. But of course, it's a little less expensive as NIPT. So, but for a person who can go beyond a dual marker may as well want to go for NIPT. But yes, we need to understand that there is a marker like this. There is an availability of this thing, which, which might we find more useful maybe sometime later. But currently, not many of us are offering this test at, at a platform. So just to touch upon last point before we actually go to the other aspects of screening for Down syndrome. So Dr. Taylor and Pravinsa, what is your routine practice for screening in twins? Just to, you know, touch upon because this is something that we really need to put across to cover the technical part. Yeah, the screening part of it is as good as a single ton. In the sense, we definitely try to do the same NT as well as the other ultrasound markers. 
when it comes to combined screening also that is the uh, biochemical parameters also we do the same thing so in a, most of the times where we have uh, the uh, the prenatal testing the guidelines as you have projected it clearly it, it obviously shows that this is this is how we are going to take the protocol so basically the most important factor is that we definitely do a, a, an NT all the ultrasound markers plus the beta hcg and pape taking into consideration the maternal age right so i think uh, what about sir uh, the, doctor anybody would like to comment upon the nipt do, do you think that we can offer nipt for twins and are we routinely offering now nipt dr kanchan mukherjee sir i, I want to ask you <laughs> Well, in first place, we got to be very careful about offering NIPT. The pre-test counseling is so very important and equally important is the post-test counseling. Um, with uh, twins, we should be even more careful because there might be issues with chorionicity. There would be issues with single fetal demise uh, and um, there might be auto reduction from triplets to twins. So there are so many different uh, issues with twins, but on the whole, yes, NIPT is appropriate in cases of twins if done in a proper manner. Right. So pre again, pre-test counseling is very important on because the first question would be which twin is affected if the NIPT comes yeah. positive. Right. And yeah. that is one question. So we need to tell them that, OK, this is just a screening. If there is something which is coming positive, we'll test both the twins. So I think no. that is something which we really need to put across when we are screening. Parna, I have a question. Yes, uh, Masu parallel sequencing, can it differentiate one from the other? Not really, sir. It is This is MPS is just counting method. So it will tell us, okay, there is some problem in some of the, in any of the twins. So we need to, the SNPs can actually differentiate between the two. But then again, no. unless we do a diagnostic testing, we will anyway not know. So like in monochorionic twin, the twin, is the risk is per twin. So because we know uh, per pregnancy, because we take the average and the rest, but uh, that's not possible. But we, we would be testing both. So that is something that we need to tell the patient that uh, if anything comes positive, we test both. Okay. Right. So thank you, sir. And uh, so Dr. Reema, uh, I'm going to put you in a tight spot here. Yes. So you uh, already so put me. Yeah. So she is like a 30 year old uh, lady who was, everything was normal. And now this is what happens that she came at 35 weeks FGR and she had ABSD, hypoplastic nasal bone and short long bones. Now, what are you going to do? How will you counsel? My question would be, would you offer diagnostic testing after 32 to 34 weeks? See, uh, yes, definitely. I would offer an invasive testing to my patient because this helps in preparedness for the baby that's going to come. Now, suppose you have a, a baby who's now Down syndrome and you are giving her uh, the mode of delivery, it will help me to decide because if they can avoid a cesarean, even at the cost of IUD for a tw trisomy 21 baby with so many other problems of AVSD, short long bones, I mean, a lot of other problems, uh, functional problems are going to land up. So they can opt for not of getting a cesarean done even if, at the cost of IUD. So definitely invasive testing should be offered. It depends on the parents, how they want to go ahead with it. But yes, that's an option to decide the mode of delivery. So I would want to know, uh, Dr. Meenu, before I take you to this question, is that, uh, is there any other option? And would you, if it had, the patient had undergone a prenatal testing and the test had come out positive, is there is is there an option and what is there in your practice? Yeah, no, so uh, I don't know whether I missed the fact that the patient have any previous scans. Yeah, so that was normal. Yeah, so, uh, see, but not necessarily that we would have picked up in screening. Again, it highlights the fact, you know, that uh, it may, uh, screening is just to assess the risk. If the screening would pick it up, yes, good, but if it, it may not pick it up also. But at this point of time, as Dr. Reema rightly pointed out, when we are counseling the patient, we would definitely offer her diagnostic testing. It would be one of the options that would be available because the patient has all right uh, to be informed about what are their options and they should know what they're going to face. Now, 
whether they want to continue or not is entirely a secondary thing it's their personal choice but they have the right to know and just because she unfortunately this is something that has been picked up for her in the later trimester does not mean that you know we do not offer her or just uh, shun her away saying that you know up to like now it is too late let's not do the test and evaluate the baby postnatally so definitely we have to put that option in front of her and be with her and right. respect her decision and take it forward right so dr tamkin ma'am i would like your opinion on this issue what what do you do in your practice so sometimes uh, we do have false negatives uh, the thing is uh, we need to preempt that and that again every patient has been emphasizing on counseling not only counseling but uh, in writing with definite figures i think that is what is going to save us and once it has become you know it's a false negative and now the baby is down it has many emotional financial social repercussions for the family and also for the doctor medical legal the 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 issue of wrongful birth the issue the, the baby even the baby can see the parents or the doctor or the parents can see the doctor all these are taken care of if we do a proper counseling the problem is that it is a common misconception among parents and also some healthcare workers because of the advertisement they will not mention the sensitivity or the specificity or the positive predictive value or the negative they will just say you will know about birth defect up to 99 to 100% something vague they will uh, advertise and that is the reason why uh, this is happening so it has to be the counseling has to be in writing uh about all the risks that can be there and then once you diagnose that it it is it has happened then you need to prepare like dr reema said you need to confirm the diagnosis that is going to help in mentally preparing the the parents as well as you know telling them what 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 to accept and how the delivery where to deliver how the delivery is to be planned so and okay. after that okay. also there will be a lot of yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, one question which is like the elephant in the room would you offer termination so i want to offer term, termination if if you asking my personal uh, at 32 weeks we can't offer in any case it's not a lethal anomaly so uh, as far as i'm aware yeah, we cannot offer so right. a medical board can be constituted and can yeah. the couple be referred in this case for termination even at 32 to 34, 34. weeks so, so i think the medical... new mtp act we can get but what ma'am is saying is also important that you know the patient's wishes yeah. needs to be seen and uh, dr meenu you wanted to say something no i just wanted to add here see we throughout the panel i think we've been talking about this pre test and post test counseling but somewhere down the line we also have to accept one fact in our practice we ourselves actually uh, end up very loosely using the term as normal which i think we all use we all have to start deferring when it comes to screening uh, we are doing pre test counseling we are a lot of us are not treating this test as simple as a hemoglobin test but when it comes to a post test counseling invariably when we see a low risk result we end up telling the patient everything is all right the result is normal so i think that is where we need to draw the line and also be very diligent in telling the patient that it is about the risk assessment that we are talking and right. you know that is where a lot of confusion actually occurs so right. once we get I out of I that yes and i completely agree with what you are saying that it is not a no risk it is a low risk always low risk yeah so we okay. need to clarify yeah. that so i will not dwell upon this point but although i would have loved to take the opinion of of the panelist on whether they would offer termination and like dr reema said yes of course if you uh, would constitute a medical board then uh, we need to take patients percep perceptions uh, you know to decide what will happen so i i just like to know from the panelist if they have any differing opinion on this yeah, or any time may be allowed yes. to say mm -hmm. so uh, the termination uh, the late the medical termination of pregnancies is not just for lethal abnormalities but also where there is likely to be a compromised quality of life and therefore from that point of view it becomes necessary for us uh, to remember that yes that becomes the right of the woman we know there's been a decision yesterday in delhi day before yesterday in delhi uh, where right uh, sir so i uh... it's really been taken further you know the uh, Uh, what what has happened is that we have realized that uh, the supreme court wishes to take further the right of the woman to say that even if it is 
not under the medical conditions that you and me have created over the years, where it's not a question of a lethal or a, a very compromised uh, a fetal quality of life, but also the mother's right, like we have in several European countries. In Germany, for instance, if a woman decides that she wants a termination of pregnancy at any time during the pregnancy, she's allowed to make that decision without her companion. And this is what Justice Chandrachud has said uh, two days ago. That, of course, is not a fight that I'm going to take in my lifetime. But with the MTP Act in place, we have to have medical boards to help us to decide. Uh, and of course, it goes beyond lethality. So, thank you so right. much, Dr. Purana, for, for that information. I was not aware of that. But what about the rights of the child? Yes. How do then... you define normal and abnormal? Yes, I know we, we're treading on very dangerous ground here. And it's and the theme really, for this, this, this year. Yes, and then, yeah. uh, you know, uh, you were the first one to use the word wrongful birth. So if we have wrongful birth and that uh, child says, uh, you know, how do I decide these things? So these are things that will continue in our discussions for the next, I, I, I know at least during my lifetime, and we won't have an answer. But in the meanwhile, we really have to have some working uh, laws and uh, working rules. And I think we'll have to just say that, look, yes, uh, there is this concept of wrongful birth and rightful birth, and also the concept of the right of the mother and the right of the child, which we are not clear on. There's no doubt that we will color it. Um, in my opinion, every, every child deserves a chance, which is why I am where I am today. But uh, the fact remains that the, these gray zones will exist all over the world. And we have to color them with our wisdom, yes. We have to color them with our experience, yes. Uh, but uh, like Aparna said, I think the time has come for the society field medicine to give some shape to these things so that at least we know what guidelines we can use. And including ethical issues, which we tend to skirt as medical people. Uh, we have to go into the ethical issues as well. So I think it's going to be a biggish set of guidelines, but it must have these specifics inside it. And I think we need to put a team together to, to work this out. Right, right. Thank you, sir. Thank Aparna. you. I think Aparna. this was, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was just waiting yes. to ask your opinion on that. Yes. Well, I have a strong view about what has been said, uh, particularly what uh, in terms of legal language, we cannot say the right of the child. A fetus becomes a child after it gets born. And right. the fetus does not have any legal right in terms of legal. I'm not going into moral or ethical issues here because we are talking pure law, which is gray, which is not gray, it's black and white. A child, get, a, a fetus gets humanhood or a personhood only after getting born. And it does not have any legal right. Now I know it has been said wrongful birth and there has been a case in UK where a child with spina bifida successfully sued the obstetrician that she she shouldn't have been born, uh, failing to terminate in that pregnancy has been taken to court when this child became an adult person after 18 years old. So all these new concepts are coming, but in our country still it exists uh, that uh, a fetus does not have any right until it gets born no matter what the gestation is. So we cannot use the word child in our discussion this evening. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you're audible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we can hear you. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, sir, for putting that so uh, crystal clear, making that crystal clear. And of course, we are not treading into the ethical and moral aspects of termination. But yes, uh, as far as legal is concerned, we are clear that currently there is, I mean, of course, there is no, uh, you know, we can't have the legal rights for the fetus. So moving on from the technical aspect, I would just want to say that this was a lady who walked into the OPD three days back. So she had previous uh, five babies who had died because of GM1 gangliosidosis. And uh, this got, you know, in 2007, the mutations were identified. Now, in her sixth pregnancy in 2018, this baby is born and this baby is a Downs baby. 
Now, this was the worker for the GM1 gangliosidosis. The mutations were identified. And with six pregnancy losses, previous pregnancy losses, this lady refused to test this baby for gangliosidosis. Whatever happens, I'm going to keep this baby. But interestingly, she underwent an NIPT because it was, she was an advanced gestational age. She was 41 years at that time. So she agreed to go for NIPT. NIPT came out to be low risk. But when the child was born, ultrasounds were normal. When the child was born, this baby is Downs. The shock and the response. And when I met this lady just three days back, I thought I will take this case to the panel because I think this is something which is very, very relevant to this day and age when we are talking about, you know, such intricate counselings. We, we're talking about pretest counselling. We're talking about NIPT. We're talking about advanced screening. So, Dr. Tamkin, I would just like to say, you know, how in how much of a big soup we are if something like that happens. And I think Dr. Naveen also would like to, uh, I would request him to comment on this, that, you know, what are the implications of this? I mean, we were safe because, you know, this lady was, uh, you know how it is. And I've actually taken a video of that lady, which I'd like to present on how she's living with that baby with Down syndrome four and a half years down the line. So I'll share that video. But uh, Dr. Tamkeen, would you like to say something on this? So she was counseled, uh, she was offered an IPT, followed, uh, okay. It's uh, it, the proper counseling was done. So medically, the doctor would be safe. But again, the patient needs your support. She needs, uh, but I, I, the, she already has one down baby. She, so this I, is the Down's baby, yes. This, no, the prior, prior, previous prior one. Baby. No baby. No, no, no baby. baby. The first baby. Yeah, so then she needs a lot of counseling and support. Uh, also, uh, we need to find out where she's living, what is the profession, how much time she'll be able to devote to that baby, how much nurturing can be there, and then also help her, you know, connect her to different groups, help her uh, by, you know, uh, offering her or telling her, giving her information, how to bring up those kids, that kid, or the whole support system, the schooling. And we have to be very, very supportive for that patient. So yeah. our job goes much beyond, you know, our clinical duties in this particular case. Right, right. So I, I completely agree. And I'll just share the details of the patient. But uh, Dr. Naveen, would you like to add something? To yeah, this? yeah. Basically, so it all boils down to the fact we come back to what we were talking earlier is counseling, counseling, counseling. Whenever we talk about any test, whether it's a first trimester, second trimester, NIPT, quad marker, anti scan, we always have to have a good counseling, whether it's anti scan, what are we trying to achieve? What are what are the basically uh, what are what are the percentages of uh, things that we will pick up like in Down syndrome in this case, and what are the in that it is a screening test is not a diagnosis test we can always miss even a NIPT like we can miss mosaicism of trisomy twenty one so this is what is very important we have to always uh, counsel the patient very well whenever we do any test whether it is NIPT or any other. Right. I completely agree with you. I mean, this was a complete disaster. Uh, you know, after everything that we have talked that, you know, this is test is so good, that test is so good, we still have misses, still babies. And in fact, in Denmark, the majority of the babies who are born with Down syndrome are because they were false negative, the screening failed. So if even after we institute universal screening, definitely there would be a proportion which would be missed. And this should be remembered every time we counsel that like what Dr. Minu said, it is not no risk, it is low risk. So I think that is something that we really need to remember. And on the flip side of it, you know, it is something that a new power has been thrust into the hands of ordinary people, the power to decide what kind of life is worth bringing into this world. And it was pointed out that Down syndrome is defined and diagnosed by a medical system, which is made up of people who have been highly successful and who are likely to base part of their identity on their intelligence. And this system giving these parents the tools to decide what kind of a children they have. It might be biased on the question of whose lives have value. So there is a complete flip side to the Down syndrome screening because most there are so many interviews which have been conducted among the women who had their pregnancy aborted. And the biggest feeling that they had was that the woman was that of guilt. 
and it is said that you know one of the sisters of a child who lived with down syndrome who actually said that if you handed any expecting parent a whole list of everything that ch their child could possibly encounter there during entire lifespan, nobody would be likely to get pregnant at all. So there is definitely a risk to all of these babies. And that is where we come to this point of velvet eugenics. So velvet eugenics is actually a soft and subtle way to encourage the eradication of disability, like the velvet revolution from which it takes the term, in which the consumer choice, velvet as in a high caliber premium tier, wouldn't you want only the best for the baby? So somewhere, this is a very subtle way of eugenics where you gently say that, okay, this baby might be having a little problem, a little disability, I mean, or, or maybe mild form, and then you end up terminating that pregnancy. So at some point in time, we have to be very careful if this is what we are moving towards and be careful on what we are counseling. Before I go on and, you know, take the last comments, I would just like to share this video. I'm sorry, I could not get it inserted because it was like a last minute thing that in the evening today I got it. So I'll just, you know. लेकिन चलता फिरता है भागता है सब काम करता है समझता है सब बात और अपनी बात को चाहे एक बात को दो बार में कह के पूरी कर लेता है लेकिन कह लेता है अच्छा हर चीज को समझता है इस आइसक्रीम वाला आता है बोलता है आइसक्रीम आइसक्रीम वालो फिर कहता है रुक जाओ फिर हमें कहेगा दस रुपए दस वाली ले आओ आइसक्रीम जब भी दस वाली हाँ हाँ जी ऐसा बस वो तो जब मुझे पता चला था डॉक्टर ने मुझे बताया मैं बहुत रोई मैंने अपने शोहर को बताया अपने पति को और और हमने किसी अपने रिश्तेदार को ये वाली बात बता नहीं रखी हम किसी को नहीं बताया अभी भी नहीं बताया और नहीं हमने नहीं बताया नहीं बैठ क्योंकि वो ना सारी रिपोर्ट्स नॉर्मल आ रही थी जैसे एनआईपीटी में बोल रहे थे पता चल जाएगा इसमें और उसमें वो था कैरोटाइपिंग था इसी में कुछ भी नहीं आया रिपोर्टों में कुछ आता ही नहीं so coming back to the panel i would just i just had these five question for questions for the woman if you know they were so moving on from what we discussed just now that you know in the western world it's all good to say that uh, you know we should be supportive and you know this what we are doing is definitely you know we have to see the picture but this is the reality in india right now any baby which has been born with down syndrome they have not even told anybody neither in the family nor in the surroundings that this baby is suffering from disability. And I also asked if there was any awareness, if there was anything that we, you know, and this is a better kind of, you know, placed lady because we have been offering counseling to her. She goes to the clinics, she, she's offered therapy, but a huge proportion of women who are actually born with, have a baby with Down syndrome, they are, you know, kind of, you know, at their own without any, help from any government agencies or support groups. So like what Dr. Tamkin was saying that, you know, it's really important that we have that kind of a, so we cannot always prevent a disability. Patients might not want to, like it was very clear that maybe even if she knew about it after having lost six children, she would not have terminated this pregnancy, but at least she should be empowered. She should be enabled that this baby is, you know, reared in a surrounding which is more uh, empowering and more enabling. So I think there is two different worlds that we are talking about. One is the idealistic world in which we talk about responsibilities, the rights of every child, the right of the disabled, inclusivity. But the reality, of course, we should be aware of. And that is where we will still be offering screening for a long, long period to come. So just to conclude, I would just take one last statement from all our panelists on what is your take on Down syndrome screening and one nugget of information.
knowledge, I would say. Dr. Kurana, sir. You know, we have to offer screening. And not because it's done all over the world, because patients want the option. The question is how much screening is something that we will decide depending on what the community can offer us. But most importantly, we have to understand, like I said in my talk, we cannot ignore the community which offers no support. I know I have worked with an organization a few years ago where we had to go from house to house pull girls with Down syndrome out of the backmost room in the house. They were tied by dog chains to make sure they won't escape from that room with a little click lock put onto that. And we used to pick them up, bring them to the school, give them vocational education and then drop them back just so they would have some sunshine in their lives. That is the kind of sunshine I hope to see in my lifetime. I know it's far away, but it's not impossible. We have to work towards that. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Dr. Kanchan, sir? Uh, pretty much what Dr. Kurana and my other respected colleagues have said, um, I think we should be really open uh, without applying our personal judgment that who, um, uh, who would like to terminate at the end of this whole journey or who would not. That's purely judgment. It's entirely their choice. The entire obstetrics is all about making it a woman-centered approach, woman-centered care. So yes, we should offer, but at the same time, our offer should not be what we have been criticized as, that our offer is basically a hunt and kill approach. It should not be like that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I really love your play of words there. So uh, thank you very much. So Dr. Teal and uh, Sir Praveen, sir. Yeah, I think uh, every lady has a right to get the uh, screening done uh, because we know uh, there is no hard and fast tool that uh, anyone, everyone is uh, prone to have an aneuploidy. So I think it is always better to get the screening done. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think that's very well put across. Dr. Tamkin, ma'am. You have to unmute yourself. So I, I don't do it universally for all patients because of many reasons. Some of them may be financial or because they're not able to comprehend at all. And then uh, maybe for previous stillbirth, previous, uh, you know, term, previous termination for malformation, uh, repeated abortions or previous uh, one uh, mid trimester abortion, family history of genetic disease, or when the patient themselves are asking for it or they are very apprehensive, then only I would offer and of course, my personal take on it is, of course, I'm very pro-life. We can only, you know, talk about morphological abnormalities or physical disabilities, but we cannot, how can you judge about somebody's, you know, intellectual ability or ethical, you know, think of Hitler, was, was he a boon or bane for, you know, human life? And Stephen Hawkins, just compare that. So I, I'm not, uh, you know, pro-offering uh, everybody or... Yeah that way i think i'm for that you know an overview and and a different approach to things and we really respect that and everybody uh, has their own uh, you know thought and feelings and you know how do they want to put it across so uh, dr reema yeah so i think everybody said it all i think uh, the babies with children with down syndrome are the most innocent soul you can ever come across so our purpose of screening is just preparedness for what's coming and it has to be uh, with statistics. We need to tell them which test offers how much screening. It's, again, no risk or low risk. And NIPT is also a screening test. It's not a diagnostic test. So with all this information, the counseling, 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 I think that's the way we deal with these, uh, with all the mothers that come to us. Thank you, Dr. Reema. I think it's the empathy which is coming out and, you know, the, the thing that, you know, we need to consider a life. So that's something that we really need to uh, think about. Dr. Meenu? Yeah, I think everybody's covered most of the points, but uh, somewhere down the line, we don't have to forget the fact that, yes, I I totally agree with inclusivity and empathy, but when we are offering screening, uh, we have to offer it to everybody. Yes, it is their personal choice. It should not be based on what we feel about the condition. It is our duty that we give the patient all the information, make them understand that such a test is available, 
that it is a screening test and that these are your options. As Dr. Kanchan rightly pointed out, it's not about hunting and killing these babies, but it is to make them aware that you have this option available and you have the option to continue understanding that probably the resources that we have to look after these babies as of today are limited. Now, the decision that they make is their own, but I don't think so we can get away without offering them screening today. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Meenu. I think you've put both the sides very beautifully. You need to balance it, offer and let the patient decide, of course. Dr. Naveen, I'm sure the last person has a very difficult job to add an extra point to what has already been said. Well, everyone has really summarized so very well. Uh, well, I what I do is my setup is whenever I do an NT scan, I always consult the patient while doing the scan, what it is about. And uh, well, um, I, I when I when we say risk, it has some negative connotations to it. If it's if it's a one by eighty, like seventy nine would be fine, you know. So I usually use the word chance rather than risk. So that is a little bit more positive kind of a thing. But we always have to uh, tell them what it is about. And basically, every negative high risk is not about termination. And uh, so it's all about counseling and telling the patient what is it about. And yes, uh, once a baby is born, obviously, we should have a support group. And basically, our, uh, our society has to take up a more larger role. We have to grow as a society as a whole. We have to empathize with them. We may have a role to play being medical professionals, you know, being a professional, I mean, educated people to help to get good support for these kind of babies. Yes. Thank you very much. And I really love the word that you say chance instead of risk. So somewhere we have we have to infuse positivity in all the testing that we are doing. So that's great. So I think uh, we are, uh, you know, I think we are over time now. So I will just say that, you know, we like within the panel itself, the feeling has, that has come out is we do deal with different Indias, right? So somewhere it is like over treatment, somewhere too little, too late or too much, too soon. I think this is something that we say for cesarean section, but it is true for every medical facility that we come across, uh, you know, in this, um, uh, in our country. So to conclude, of course, we know that the first trimester screening is ideal. Do not repeat a high-risk report. NIPT can be offered at secondary screening and invasive tests are available for high-risk screening after proper counseling. So this is what we are talking about. And eventual aim is integration. And we do hope that someday we're going to reach that level where all of these babies are easily integrated in the uh, society. We must have a pre-test counseling, screening versus diagnostic test should be explained, post-test counseling is important, respect parental autonomy and their choices, and diagnosis is not synonymous with termination. Diagnosis just has to be discussed in terms of options. So I think that is all I would like to say. These are the babies which have been discussed. So I think this was the picture who just, we had, we had seen the video. So, you know, a lot of babies of Down syndrome, they grow up to be good individuals, human beings who have well adjusted in the society. So it is our movement and our, our target should be integration. So thank you very much for the uh, you know uh, nice inputs from all of the esteemed panelists. And, uh, uh, and we do hope that, you know, uh, we'll be able to incorporate, you know, some of these learnings into our practice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Bimal, you have something to say. Yes. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make a point here that, uh, you know, everybody has said whether we should offer, we should not offer. But I just want to say that offering a test does not mean writing a referring letter and sending the patient away. Offering a test is something where, you know, we actually need to really ask them whether they really want to screen for, uh, you know, for aneuploidy. Because it just have I, I in my practice I can say that ninety nine percent of the patients who come to me actually do not know what they have come for. It's just become a norm. I I recently had I did a growth scan on a patient who actually had got screening done, screen positive, got an amnio done, came positive for trisomy twenty one. But she said I was never told. They told me do this. I did that. But I actually never want to terminate this pregnancy. I have conceived after so many years. I'm, I, you know, I'm very happy with uh, whatever. So offering is different. And like Naveen said about a chance, if you don't want pregnancies to be terminated based on a screening test, if it is one in hundred, uh, don't say that there is a one chance of 
this fetus fetus having Down say that there is a 99 99% chance of this baby being normal. I think uh, people will stop terminating based on screening itself. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Bimal, for that last input. And my thanks to the panel and to Dr. Parna for this. We have, uh, as you know, our webinars are always open-ended at the Society of Fetal Medicine. This was a policy decision beautifully taken by Dr. TLM Praveen when he brought us all together during COVID times. And so over now to, uh, to Dr. Krishna Gopal uh, to take over the uh, audience queries and uh, the entire panel is still here. Bimal is also with us and uh, everyone can answer here. What a panel it was. It was, it was, it, it was uh, one of the uh, greatest uh, uh, panel on uh, Down syndrome. It has, it has every component we have seen the flip side of it. We have seen that how it is. It is. It is a two world, and how it is different uh, from 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 other part of the world. And even in our own country, also we have we have we have different mindset, different world also. So oh, we have we have few two uh, very interesting questions here that I will take, and I will request the uh, 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 panelists to be a part of it in. Uh, answering them. So the first question uh, is by Dr. Uh, Gita Devi is that should we offer a screening by NIPT even after 24 weeks if she misses NT scan and, um, and comes for T5 scan at 24 weeks or later and normal ultrasound. So as yes, we can offer them NIPT at this time also if the uh, a patient acts Accepted. Reason being that uh, enteritis anti screening has not been done before. Are the are the are the uh, uh, panelists agree with me on this? Yes, I would completely agree with you. There has been this. Uh, people get very confused about the old MTP Act and whether it covered uh, diagnostic uh, testing or invasive testing or screening, and there is no doubt that. Uh, that NIPT can be done, as can all other tests, including invasive testing, up to 41 weeks of gestation. Uh, uh, second question is by Dr. Dr. Uh, Shivani Garg, that should we offer NIPT before NT scan or after? Of course, it should be after NT scan, because NT scan is not only the measurement of uh, knuckle translucency, it is rather than the e e evaluation of the uh, other detailed anomalies as well. So oh, 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 it is uh, prudent to, to offer NIPT after the uh, NT scan. Third question is, is uh, very interesting by Dr. Varsha. What about uh, uh, vanishing twin combined test for NIPT, which is better? And if anyone is better, then should it be timed? So, so basically in both NIPT as well as combined test can be offered, but patient has to tell that uh, the chances of false positive is high in these in these cases, and and the uh, reason being that uh, uh, serum free e, e, e beta SCG is not uh, affected, but of course papa a a a levels are varied in cases of uh, of of uh, these uh, vanishing twins. So oh, if the lab has a correcting factor, so oh, we can offer them. Otherwise, we can time them as long as the six weeks. Panelist, if if you have any any other opinion about this, yeah, it's the same, Doctor Krishna. So basically, what happens is when you have a fetal pole that you've seen in the vanishing twin, we end up not offering combined tests because of combined the reason that you said, because the pape excretion life is longer, so the half life okay. is longer. So in those cases, if uh, uh, the good mode of screening would be to offer an NIPT six weeks after we've uh, documented the demise of the the uh, vanishing twin. But if you've not seen the fetal pole right from the pregnant uh, starting of the pregnancy, then probably combined test would do. It's yes. only in cases where you see a fetal pole, you would defer offering a combined test and would offer an NIPT six weeks after the documentation. Correct. Doctor... Yeah. Uh, Sumit uh, Mishra asked that if in DCDA twins, NT normal and dual marker not done, 
should we offer her quadruple even if anomalies can having no sort marker because because generally a e, e, second uh, uh, trimester screening is avoided in in twins reason being that uh, serum free e, e, beta hcg levels are so high that most likely it gives a false uh, a positive reports so oh, ideally it should be should, should be avoided in these cases yeah also i'm not sure the quadruple has been validated for twins yeah it is not it is not in, in fact validated and and sir whenever it is it is it is uh, offered most of the time it uh, end up uh, giving the false positive reports yeah so it's not validated so there's no question of using it yeah uh, another question is uh, normal normal the anomaly scan mid uh, uh, trimester FGR or mean uterine artery PI more than 95th centile should we go for invasive testing? So uh, in cases of early onset FGR, we do offer uh, uh, invasive testing in view of in view to, to, to rule out the chromosomal uh, abnormality. Uh, then the question, I think that we have taken all the questions. If it is just wonderful. How do we manage patient who has been offered NIPS for Downs screening and they a, a come back with reports suggestive of trisomy 16 in absence of any ultrasound abnormalities, low risk for Downs. So oh, we must uh, uh, confirm them with the uh, invasive testing for this. Uh, there was one question somewhere about invasive testing in in, uh, in growth restriction. I think we have that in the chat somewhere. There is the same question, sir. That uh, they have asked that normal anomaly scan mid uh, uh, trimester fetal growth restriction or mean uterine artery PI more than ninety percent. That was the same question. Uh, then one more interesting question I saw in the last uh, should, we, should, should we offer invasive testing or NIPT when we see soft marker in anomaly scan yeah uh, uh, ideal way is doing is doing a, uh, invasive testing if we have ultrasound markers but if the patient choose to go or or NIPT Knowing that we can we can uh, go for an idea. So I think yeah. and also it depends upon what soft marker, yeah. soft marker, marker, marker yes. yeah. short long bones and absent nasal bones. So so basically these two have a, a high high likelihood ratio. No? no, and also if there's ventricular megaly, then you're not only looking at chromosomes, you're also looking at infection right. possibility yeah. of any evolving well. lesion. Yeah. So we so have different. to see which soft marker is positive and accordingly take a call. And so how you, many soft markers also? Yeah, uh, a, a combination of unossified nasal bone with anything else definitely increases the risk. So increases the risk so high. What is the role of fetal fraction in in the uh, NIPT? So basically, it is a percentage of fetal cells in the in the in the maternal blood, and if it is less than four percent, so oh, these uh, reports are are not are not reliable. So actually, there is also a new emerging concept now. It's a lab-based fetal fraction. So it may not necessarily be a cutoff of 4%, but every lab has its own cell fraction, which they take as a standard. So we have to check up with the lab that what is their cutoff for fetal, fetal cell fraction. So that's the changing concept. Now, we don't have 4% as a cutoff that we initially used to be talking of. I'm correct, Dr. Kurana, sir, if you could... Uh, I yes, don't you're absolutely it. correct. Oh, you are, you are uh, correct. Uh, earlier we, we used uh, four percent for this, but now now different uh, labs has a uh, different uh, cutoff for fetal yeah. fraction. Since since we've changed over to sequencing, uh -huh. we can always do a little more deeper sequencing and come up with more reliable answers in screening, uh, even with a smaller fetal fraction. And uh, so this is something that's evolving. But we have to know, as you said, uh, that it is always lab based and that the lab must indicate it in their screening report on what they require as a basic uh, fraction. So some of the newer companies that have come up with uh, with uh, sequencing-based uh, uh, risks 
uh, they they don't need a fetal fraction. Correct. Hypoplastic nasal bone, but combined screening and NIPT low risk. Basically, hypoplastic nasal bone is not only indicative of uh, of amnioplasty; it is also indicative of rare rare regenerative syndromes. So, oh, so in cases of uh, hypoplastic you know, nasal bone, it is it is it is a uh, better to to offer offer the uh, and and uh, invasive testing rather than, rather than uh, what what about soft markers like uh, echogenic focus in ventricle they don't hardly <laughs> offer don't do anything <laughs> and and they are uh, present in 30 percent of uh, normal normal Asian population we, we also have some very nice uh, for the first time ever that i have seen really reliable guidelines from smfm uh, which is the uh, american based Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. They had very good guidelines that came out last year on second trimester soft markers and what we should do for each one of the eight. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. actually put that one is, that case is a, that on is that. Very good paper. Yeah. That is very good paper. Individual individual markers and what what uh, should be done in that. Yes. Also, we have this very old concept that was created by Beryl Benasaraf uh, that if we have more than two markers, we should do invasive testing. That is certainly not true. It's something that was very very valid when she mentioned this in 1987, but in 2023, uh, two markers is certainly not valid for invasive testing. Depends on which two markers again, sir. True, absolutely. Yeah, so maybe if, it, if, if be... one of them is ventriculomegaly or unossified nasal bone, sure. then it goes automatically. But okay. if it is like a pelviactasis with ecogenic focus, definitely not. Truly, and you know, even one marker can be enough for invasive testing. And, and six markers may not be enough for invasive testing because right. we know that that list is one of the most uh, tragic lists that we have ever seen uh, for, for, for uh, you know, the likelihood ratios and everything else. It makes, math math it makes mathematics out of everything. And I don't think that's the way to go. We have to have uh, the uh, experience and wisdom to handle this. Uh, well, like, uh, uh, if I can just come in here, I'll just like to... Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Krishna Gopal, could you educate everyone here in this panel and all our delegates about the ecogenic focus, whether it's an indication for fetal eco? Uh, we we no, still are getting that very frequently. See, 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 see. There is a, there, is, there is a. Uh, uh, I think the the commonest referral for fetal eco comes from uh, from, from uh, intracardiac ecogenic focus. But I have I have very uh, interesting experience once when it was referred for intracardiac ecogenic focus. That was a, a small rhabdomyoma, and, and later on it it uh, grows also. So yes, if you have a very tiny speckle and it is and it is ecogenic intracardiac focus, it is not an indication for fetal echocardiography. Thank you. But it is see if it depends upon the person who has done the. Scan, if they feel that you know they found a fi finding and they're really not uh, because this whole concept is that it doesn't have any significance if it is isolated the word isolated is very important correct it also depends upon how confident you are to say that it is isolated isolated so i'll stop giving this uh, telephonic advice on soft markers because i've had some very bad experiences where when the patient came to me i realized that you know it was that was not the only thing which was uh, present and then there were other other findings present and that actually changed the complete uh, scenario and that is why uh, if uh, you know maybe because fetal eco generally goes to a more experienced person and hence, I think it becomes another opportunity for somebody with better experience to, uh, you know, precisely say that is, this is definitely an isolated finding. Excellent. That is, that is true. Yeah. That is absolutely true. It, it, gives, it gives a chance to, 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 to see the heart in a, in, in a better experienced person many times. But, uh, but uh, this is a, not an the absolute indication of it. Yeah. But having having said uh, having said that, uh, uh, I mean it it doesn't excuse us from the idea of looking at the heart in every anomaly scan. We should be looking at the heart in every anomaly scan. 
because if you are doing that and having good structural scan, if it's truly isolated, I don't think it is an indication and it would just be increasing our uh, finances or whatever you may call them. Yeah. That's um, great. Also, Bimal, uh, I noticed we've opened a, a famous Pandora's box and everyone <laughs> wants to know about each one of the intrameister findings. So could you please, please, please have a webinar for us where we finally put the lid and hammer it in tight on what we're supposed to do with our second trimester findings. Perhaps after Diwali, we can have a webinar which yes. can be international because the questions are the same all over the world. Yes, sir. we'll do that. Thank you. There are uh, many questions about soft markers that we have just discussed and what the, what the conclusion is that likelihood ratio should be calculated and if they are on the in the higher risk, we should we should we should counsel it accordingly. One one interesting uh, question is small stomach, but first trimester screening and NIPT is is a uh, low risk. What to do? Please. Anyone from the back? small stomach is just a finding. Uh, so yeah, I'm very I surprised. Think... They've done both first trimester screening and NIPT for the patient and what? worrying about small stomach, which is a very subjective call. Very, very, very subjective. Uh, follow her up and that's all. Follow her up, maybe 27, 28 weeks. Yeah. And then see whether there is a proximal esophageal pouch or uh, you have polyhydramnios. Yes. Once that happens, then, then the we story... need to raise the alarm. Yeah. No, no. The question is, could it be related to the tracheoesophageal fistula? Yeah, that is what I am saying. Yeah. You can't just That's say. Uh... We, have wait. we have to wait for the for the pharyngeal pouch to develop. We have to wait, wait for the polyadamnios to develop. There are many many supportive things that we can see. But isolated, a, a small stomach for NIPT, it can't seem justified. And also, let me tell them because it's just related to that the the overall detection prenatal detection rate of tracheoesophageal fistula in the best of the centers is also very low. So it just comes to about 30, 35 percent of the cases, and that is something which everybody should be aware of. Uh, many cases of pyleptosis, how to manage? You should measure it correctly. You should you should uh, uh, group it into the into in, into UTD and and then you, you manage it accordingly. We will wait for uh, the webinar. <laughs> does, does, does NIPT also offer micro deletions? And we only get information regarding annuality and sex chromosomes. Aparna, your question, can you please take it? Micro deletions. I, I'm well, not sure Dr. Uh, Aparna is <laughs> getting our connection correctly. Um, Uh, there's an interruption. Yeah. Breaking a little. There's an interruption. Yeah. So, Sir, can take this question. Yeah. No, no. Um, uh, Colonel Rima, you were going to tell us. No, uh, sir. So, micro deletions is still not validated as I far as our clinical practice is concerned. So, we, uh, we, people are offering it, but as of now, NIPT stands for the five common chromosomes. Oh, that's that's all. We should not think much about it. Yes, I, I think that's absolutely correct. That uh, there was just one attempt to uh, to validate. Uh, deletion 22Q11 last year that was widely accepted and still not by too many of the companies. And so really it's uh, it's not part of a routine NIPT. Let's accept the fact that as of today, NIPT equals trisomy 21 and not even 13 and 18. Correct. So uh, yes, the NT the scan does not equal to the NT scan. NT scan is not equal to uh, to trisomy 21, the 11 to 14 scan is not equal to trisomy 21. On the other hand, uh, NIPT is equal to trisomy 21 and pretty much uh, not even that all the time. This is also an answer to that question on <laughs> whether, uh, you know, the combined screening uh, in the era of NIPT. Uh, in fact, a combined screening, because we are structurally looking for anomalies, 
with in, in the nt scan is a better screening for trisomy 13 and 18 than an nipt is so i think we're pretty much through with the questions now yeah. most of the questions we have last one is today i had a patient who had a raised nt she could she could not afford invasive but with ayushman we helped her did her amnu at 19 weeks trisomy 21 came positive but she has decided to continue her pregnancy so how can i help how to prepare for her future and she is not uh, very affording she is not very affording yeah so there are different help groups around for uh, trisomy 21 babies government also have few of the program that i was searching for so 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 you can try to reach her for for this and uh, we uh, in in the society of fetal medicine also developing these uh, kind of uh, a support system with 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 the uh, government uh, uh, in future for these children we we plan to put all these on our website very soon whichever you know support groups and everything we will put on our website so that uh, our members can take benefit out of that we will have a separate column on all these support groups for different different disorders that we have so it should come up soon excellent uh, dr parna you have your hand up no no sir i just wanted to reemphasize that you know as far as the disability is concerned of course we need to be very aggressive about it early initiation of therapy occupational therapy speech therapy but also importantly because down syndrome is associated with a lot of actual medical disorders you should be in uh, you're delivering that baby in a good place because now that they have decided so we must for the best possible medical care because you know the cardiac disorders thyroid disorders endocrine disorders everything is more so i think that is also a very important aspect while at the same time identifying early therapy for inclusivity i think that's something that's very very important excellent to summarize that's absolutely marvelous and i guess with that we come to the end of our session today so over to dr sunil mehta for his uh, vocal uh, thanks please uh, uh, navin also has raised hand navin please small query from dr aparna i was kind of curious about the video that she showed the patient was saying that uh, her karyotype was normal so what is your comments on that the patient who we saw we saw it was abnormal she said that karyotype was normal and it the baby turned out to be down syndrome so what are comments no 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 actually aparna pointed out right in the beginning that nipt was the low risk but Uh, they didn't opt for. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right, I think right, right. that's uh, the patients ah, are unaware about it. it and... Probably, probably, right, right, right. Yeah. So. so over to you, Dr. Sunil Mehta, please, for our vote of thanks. Thank you, everybody, for listening patiently for our wonderful program on Down Syndrome Day. A superlative panel discussion by Dr. Aparna. and uh, very very good discussions by all our panelists khurana sir bimal sir meenu batra reema bhat navin parera tlen pravin sir everybody so thank you very much and uh, we'll continue with these kind of programs regularly thank you good night everybody good night sir good night good night good night sir good night sir right good night thank you good night everyone thank you